processing. And now there are some other seasoning elements. Paprika, a little bit of onion powder, always to your taste, a little bit of salt, sea salt, of course, and a little bit of pepper. And here, of course, is our blue cheese, because our blue cheese is just the essence, the centrality of this dish. The blue cheese, as I add it, basically remains whole. What we take in is scrambled blue cheese. We do not want for this to melt. One way of making the dressing is to melt all the ingredients together, but that's not what I want. At this point, we're pretty much where we want to be, except, and here it is, the magic and secret addition. This is the reduction that we made earlier with the brown sugar and the vinegar, which is now completely cool. This was white vinegar, by the way. This is the molasses that has melted away from the brown sugar that's really giving this incredible look to this dish. Why is this so important? There is a, a bit of the sweet and sour taste, agrodulce, as we say in Italian. Slightly changes the color, but it brings an element of flavor to this dish, which is out of this world. Well, the next thing I want to show you is how to cut a wedge salad. First thing we do, we cut the salad in half. Once we cut it in half, we cut it in quarters. There's a series of leaves on the outside that I want you to slightly take off. Uh, these leaves tend to be a little bit on the brown side. They are somewhat damaged. Prettiness is at the core of everything. Another thing that you want to do is to flatten the bottom so the salad sits perfectly. And also what I like to do right here is to cut this part of it. Let's do it with another piece so you see exactly. First, we go and we flatten it. Why is this important, by the way? I'll show you in just a second. Now in this one, as you can see, there is not the core because most of it was in this cut, so we'll use this as my favorite look. Once you cut through the core, now you're left with a half moon shape, but you're still not over to it. Think this. If you simply put the half moon on top of the plate and you move the plate around to bring it to the table, because of the fact that there's not a proper stability, the piece of the salad, the whole shape, the whole wedge of it could actually slip right out. It's happened to me before. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I discovered this trick. So what I want you to do, look at the biggest area of the salad in the back of it, and with your knife, attentively, slice a little flat piece to it, so that you have now created for the salad a flat surface in which the salad can actually stand still in the middle of the plate. Not only as you decorate it with the other ingredients, but also as you bring it to the diners at your table with pride and joy. You will thank me for this. And now, we're ready to play. First time I had the salad was at a steakhouse, and I could not believe how flavorful this was. But as you take every bite, there is a series of flavors all building on top of each other and giving us the salad, which is a steak by itself. You have all these incredible flavors. We have the croutons that connected with the bacon that has this wonderful finish to it, connects with the tomatoes, we have flushed in there. We also have the blue cheese dressing that just gives it the dimension that we're looking for. This is not your average everyday salad, but in spite of the fact that I came to the steakhouse for a steak, this salad was more attractive to me than the steak was. And this is how you make wedge salad Stellino style. You have to understand that to us, uh, a salad is something that we have in our daily diet, but the only dressing I knew was vinegar and olive oil. It all came from my grandma's farm anyway. I had never seen a Thousand Island. I never seen a blue cheese dressing and all those other things that come with it. <laughs> I have to say, I was barely in my 20s at the time. I just to see my father so happy uh, to see him find so much joy just in putting together a salad. <laughs> I thought it was one of the greatest moments of my life. To this day, every time I walk by a salad bar, I always think of my father. I'm thinking, and you guys are working on my show, walking around with this thing wrapped in plastic and you eat them. I would have made you sandwiches, for God's sake. I would have pasta for everybody. We sit down, we eat, and I walk around with those sticks. And then they go tell everybody that work with me. No, really, they do. You should see them. They're like this when they start out. Especially this guy. He's fast, he's quick. You have no idea. This guy could dive and catch an arancine in mid-flight. Next time I make a ranchino, I'll make a few extra for him. He needs some. Look at him. So tiny. Benvenuti in cucina. Welcome to my kitchen. Today, we're going to make... 
cantaloupe soup, the perfect recipe for a chill soup. Salmon filet presented with an astonishing sauce. It features spinach and pancetta. And we end with a Sicilian almond pudding, the Anko Mangiare. And I will answer the perplexing question, can Nick Stellino be a vegetarian? <laughs> Go for the recipes. Stay for the story. From time to time, my friends asked me if I could be a vegetarian. I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, it's not gonna happen. But I have an enormous amount of vegetarian dishes which I consider to be great and in need of no meat whatsoever. Does it ever happen to you in summertime you feel like soup? Well, I have the perfect recipe for a chill soup. It's made with cantaloupe, then there's some parmesan cream that we place on top, and some tidbits of prosciutto turn into wonderful crunchy chips. Let me show you how to make it. I did not believe into the possibility of something that could actually make cold soups and make it taste great. However, if you do like soup, and it's summertime, and you're looking for something that reminds you of Italy, this is the soup. Cantaloupe soup with prosciutto and Parmesan cream is one of my most proud creations, but there are some very basic techniques I need to walk you through. First, let's take a look at the prosciutto. Prosciutto is not like bacon. In spite of the fact that there is a certain amount of fat in the prosciutto, there's not so much fat that really will actually save it if you were to cook it on super high heat. What we want to do, we want to dry out this prosciutto. How do we do it? The first thing that I do is I place the pan on medium heat to get it nice and hot. And now I'm going to put the oil. I brush just a little bit of oil. I like to use extra light. And then the super thin slices of prosciutto di parma, we place them right on the pan. And we will notice within a matter of moments, they will start to dry up. You can see the drying up process right through the changing of the color. You do not want to go high heat on this one. If you go high heat on this one, you are going to burn them. So with the moderate heat, it gives you the ability to follow it through. And you can see through the changing of the color when these particular pieces are ready. Do not use your fingers, thinking that you can just move everything around. Your fingers will not like you. There you are. Just let it go at it until the color changes and we go almost to this very color, which is the sear color of the prosciutto, which has completely dried through. The prosciutto is nice and toasty. We're gonna let it rest because while the prosciutto is finishing up, I'm going to show you how to make the Parmesan cream sauce. I know, I know, this is exciting. I'm going to make uh, Parmesan cream sauce. You see me actually making this last year when I showed you to make uh, the tortellini alla panna. The concept is the same. A good portion of the cream is made out of water. So what we're aiming to do of a medium heat is to reduce the cream and liberate it of most of its water. So here we go with that. And together with the cream, a little bit of Parmesan cheese. Parmigiano Reggiano, of course, eh? And then consistently. Mix it up. Mix it up until the cream starts to simmer. In the process of simmering, you will notice that the cream will put out bubbles, first on the edges, then it will move closer to the end. As long as you keep moving like this, you will not burn the Parmigiano. All that you're trying to do at this point is simply getting rid of the water and thickening up the cream that we'll use as a topping, as a decoration for our soup. Well, everything is ready. We got our prosciutto that we're gonna chop up and, uh, into tiny bits. Our cream sauce is finished and reduced perfectly. Now, let me show you to make the soup. Well, in terms of cooking, there's very little to be done. So first we go in with the cantaloupe, and I put the cantaloupe, which I, of course, peeled and cut into cubes like this. These days, many supermarkets, by the way, offer the service. You can have the fruit already cut, and if you buy it and use it the same day, this is ideal for you. A little bit of Parmesan cheese. Then we go with white balsamic vinegar. Why? 
What the vinegar does, it works as an accelerator. It forces in a certain way, without cooking any of the ingredients, chemically through its own properties, to mold all these flavors into the perfect way. Without the vinegar, it would taste tremendously different. Fresh uh, uh, chopped uh, basil, uh, chopped white onions that we're going to add as well, uh, and a little bit of water just to get this whole process started. Chilled water, of course. Then put the cover on top. You think that this is something obvious. Trust me, for as much as I might appear as a man of decent intelligence, many times I put all the ingredients together, and this always happens at a party when there's a lot of people. Then I push the button, next thing you know, this thing explodes upwards. So this time I got my hands in here. It was so hard for me to do. It took a lot of effort. Hold on, let me take a breath here because I really, I really went over the top. <laughs> I'm kidding you. We still need to add some more flavors. What? Of course, the first thing that we're gonna do is a little bit of Nixtelino Magic Rub. It's gotta go in there. The salt, onion powder, garlic powder, brown sugar, pepper, and paprika. Also, for you, when you make this at home, always start with the pulse. It will ensure success for you. One last ingredient we need to add, and that's extra virgin olive oil. I'm gonna add it now, and I don't wanna say anything because otherwise the sound will completely obliterate me. And this is going to be totally processed and emulsified into the soup. Now, the soup is ready, but it's not flavored yet. The consistency is exactly what we want. Nice and wonderful. I can smell from the aroma that we have everything in here. But the flavors need to come together. For this to come together, it needs to live in the refrigerator for a few hours. The soup for me is a major achievement. It's a major achievement because I never thought I could give consistency to a chilled soup that would have all the flavors of Italy the way that I embody them in my mind. And to be able to achieve this is a big deal. This is a very fancy dish as far as I'm concerned, and I like to present it as such. We have uh, chopped our prosciutto, and what I like to do at this point is to basically sprinkle it on top of it. Why is this important? Do not go over the top too much. Remember that in spite of the fact that they're such small pieces, they're very, very salty. The last bit of addition that I like to make is the Parmesan cream. This, to me, is the kind of soup that I would present at a wedding, especially a summer wedding, is a soup in which I would present to somebody that I would like to greatly impress, like a grand business associate, or for you out there, uh, single people. This is a wonderful way to start a first date. And this is how you make cantaloupe soup with Parmesan cream and prosciutto chips. I believe that Every ingredient has a personality of its own. And if you find the line in the middle, the line that takes you to this journey that you're trying to get, in terms of what the flavors will bring you, the ability to understand the flavors and how they come in and where they go is the most important thing for every person when they're in the kitchen to realize that just because you do it one way, it can be done 10 different ways. And especially here in the United States of America, there are so many inspirations from all these cultures that come around. This is a recipe I'm totally excited about it. Salmon filet, cooked very simply, but presented with an astonishing sauce. It features spinach and pancetta, but that's not it. There's even sour cream in there and lime juice. Let me show you how to make it. In the pan, we have some hot oil. Now I'm gonna walk you step by step in showing you how I make this incredible sauce, which I didn't even give it a name. I simply call it uh, uh, a sauce with uh, <laughs> spinach, sour cream, and pancetta. But the ingredients come in at a different time. We go with the onions. Now, 
What I've done, I've chopped the onions super fine. And now, to the onions, we're gonna add the pancetta that I've also chopped quite fine. Why, people ask me often, says, why do you like to put pork with fish? It's not that it's, it's a special thing, but there is something about this combination of flavors that they just get along. It's like having a chocolate chip uh, cookies with a glass of milk. You can't beat the flavor. I will not say this is the same thing, but the combination of the two really works very well. In this process right now, something wonderful is happening. The onions are exchanging flavor with the pancetta. The pancetta, which is Italian style of bacon, is already full of flavor, an enormous amount of it. So you notice I haven't put to any salt or any pepper as of yet, something that we'll move on later into it. The next add that I make is going to be uh, chopped garlic. If you wanted to substitute with a more interesting addition instead of the garlic, you could go with ginger. I've done them before and it works wonderfully well. You're gonna let this cook for a couple of moments, stirring well and keeping an eye. You do not want to burn the pancetta. You just want to render in there and you want to start browning. The moment is ideal now. I add a little bit of my Nix magic. The salt, pepper, onion powder, garlic powder, uh, paprika, brown sugar. In equal parts, they really have a fantastic yin-yang effect. And you can see already how they're coloring the bottom of this, giving us the flavor that I want. That's the brown sugar. The molasses is breaking down. The onion powder, the garlic powder, already assaulting this. This by itself, as it is, is super fabulous. We're gonna deglaze it all with a little bit of brandy. Stir well as the brandy evaporates. Now, why are we doing this? Why am I stirring like this? You're noticing that the bottom of the pan, the color is becoming a little bit darker. Those are the brown bits that were stuck at the bottom that we are reincorporating uh, through the usage of the liquid, in the case, the brandy, and we're making this wonderful. How wonderful? <laughs> Wait, I'm not done yet. Here we go with the chopped spinach. Why did I chop it? I could have put a whole leaf if I wanted to because this will collapse in no time. The water that is present in the spinach, even after you chopped it, is going to give us a fantastic flavor. It is at this point that you want to reduce the heat to medium low and slowly cook the sauce. But there is one more addition that I need to make to this. This addition, I would like to tell you that it was spurred by genius. Every time I talk about myself, the word genius is very applicable. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't love yourself, who's going to? I know. My wife says, you're always giving yourself compliments. What am I going to do, insult myself? But truly, the way this thing came together was kind of strange. I had a lime laying around. Earlier in the day, I've seen somebody making a drink with a lime juice, and I thought, you know what? This would be fantastic, especially if I want to maintain the, 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 the acidity into the sauce in a very elegant way, because the next addition that we're going to make is going to be the sour cream. So here I go with about a tablespoon and a half of lime juice. And uh, the first time that I understood how important is the juice of lime, lemons, and oranges was in another dish that a friend of mine, uh, an Armenian uh, friend of mine, brought uh, to my house. She brought me a gift of lakmajun, to my understanding, is known as Turkish pizza. Uh, the lakmajun at the end has a big, huge spray of lemon that you put on it to really bring all the flavors together. I had never seen that done in the motion before. Usually lemon or lime, to me, are placed on top of raw food. But in this particular case, there is an opening that takes place where the acidity of this juice is almost like blossom. Now we're gonna bring this down to a low heat and we're going to add the sour cream. Look already how beautiful this is. The reason why I don't want to cook the sour cream on high heat, I don't want it to break down. I want to maintain its viscosity, its look, and its feel. Slowly, as all these elements will continue cooking amongst themselves, the sauce will really render in a wonderful way. At this point, we're basically done. So what I like to do is to just let the sauce cook on low heat for the next four or five minutes. And while the sauce is cooking, let me show you how to cook the salmon. That's gonna be fantastic. This technique, you've seen it often done in the American barbecue. Now you make the spice rub stick to your protein. One of the simplest way to do it is basically taking a little bit of mayonnaise. It could be olive oil, 
Uh, it could be basically anything, even water, if you want to. But what mayonnaise does have, it continues uh, the message of the acidity that's brought forth by the lime. At this point, I go with my Nixtelino special rub, and I put it right in here. This is the first side of the fish that will go down. Now, uh, a size of salmon like this, we're looking at about two and a half minutes per side on medium heat. Why? <laughs> and this is very important. A lot of people feel that if you can sear the fish real quickly and then turn it over, well, what you're gonna end up doing really is not so much uh, maintaining the juices on the inside of the fish, but you're gonna dry out the fish. And one of the biggest mistakes that most people do when they cook fish, they cook it as if it was meat. Uh, fish needs a gentle cooking, especially during this process. Right at this very moment, what is taking place, the brown sugar, which is part of the spice pack that I put on top of it, is already crystallizing itself and creating a small, tiny armor around it. Now you can also see, and you need to see this, do you see how you can see how the cooking of your fish is taking place? It's like at the very bottom, you can see a cooking still raw on this side. Now we need to turn it. Watch this technique. Because the biggest mistake that people make is to turn it real fast and then you splash. And when you splash, this oil is unforgiving. Actually, it's quite cruel. So what I do, I go underneath with the spatula, hold it in with a spoon, off we go to the other side. And look what a beautiful, beautiful bit of fish we have. Now we're gonna let this cook all the way to the end. And uh, one of the things that I want you to realize is that once you input this kind of flavoring right on here, it will impact every single bite that you take. This flavoring is quite impactful by itself because it has a diversity of layers. The onion powder, the garlic powder, the brown sugar, the salt, many of those things that seem to work against each other seem to come together into this flow. And also it gives to the fish the perfect look. The last technique that I'm gonna use is known as rosé. It's the adding of soft butter to the pan which we are going to use to baste the top of the salmon. And watch what I do. How important is this? It's fantastic, look at it. It restores a shimmering glow, and at the same time, it baits it, making it much more tender. You do not know this, but the butter, the butter has not only a wonderful protected quality to it, but an infusion of flavors that's picking up as going to the bottom and reincorporating with all the wonderful spices that are part of the salmon. The fish is basically ready. The sauce is ready, and I'm smiling. Why? Because now I'm going to show you how to plate it. A sour cream sauce. Uh, I've been traveling through France and uh, a couple of restaurants had a real interesting sauces that were made with cream spinach. And I thought there might be a way to kind of bring up the action on this. This is as elegant as it is thick. For things to taste great, they don't need to be complicated. They just need to taste great. And this is a wonderful way for us to put all these flavors together. And this is how you make salmon filet over a sauce made of pancetta, spinach, and sour cream. A masterpiece. But when it comes to me, the biggest thing is the making of caponata. People say, well, what is caponata? Hey, caponata, if you want to think about it, is nothing more than an eggplant relish. But within the context of caponata, there's the whole story of Sicily in it. There are the cape berries. Together with the cape berries, there is the tomato sauce and the extra virgin olive oil, the frying of the eggplant, the vinegar, the sugar, the marination that is left within. And then, and then there is a surprise that nobody expects. Cocoa powder bitter cocoa powder that's added to the caponata, which suddenly changes the color altogether. Before yourself, you see the depth of the red becoming almost a strong brown. And as all this thing happens, you feel these flavors coming at you, and after all this is put together, it's not over. Then there is the fresh herbs that you put in. You start with some chopped garlic, of course, and then you go with mint, parsley, basil. People say vegetarian dishes are boring. I don't know what restaurant you go to, <laughs> of all you do is you just boil a potato and you eat it. But there is a truth in the essence of vegetarian dishes, which is spectacular. I know that you realize that I've gained some weight since you saw me last time. What I'm about to show you now, it's exactly how it happened. And you could call it a Sicilian almond pudding, but as Sicilians, we even have a better name, Bianco Mangiare. Let me show you how to make it.
Bianco Mangiare. Hey, bianco Mangiare is a, <laughs> a very Sicilian recipe from the town of Palermo where I'm from. In the pan, the first thing that we want to do is to add chopped almonds. What do we do it this way? Uh, I ain't going to stir this almond around in just a moment, but what I'm going to do before I do that, I'm gonna put some sugar. In this case, it's white refined sugar. I want for the sugar to hug the almond and to almost give him a nice, wonderful, sweet coating. You don't wanna do this for too long, just a, a couple of moments like this. The idea here is to infuse uh, the liquid with the taste of the almonds. Now you'll see what I mean. I've always done it with milk but I liked it to have a little bit heavy. In this case, I use half and half. Traditionally, you would do this with milk alone, but half and half is more of a, almost like a, an ice cream-like texture to it. And then we go with sugar. This is not for a diet. This is real sugar that we put in here, and we put it because we want to have the sweet. And then you start basically stirring around. In this stirring process, several things are happening. The sugar is melting into the milk. As the sugar melts into the milk, the toasting also is bringing out the oil from the almonds. As the almonds release their oil into the milk, it's as if we're making our own homemade almond milk. At this point, the next thing that we want to do is to thicken this. There is two modus operandi here at play. One is the cornstarch. The cornstarch is my favorite one. What the cornstarch does, it basically takes the mass of liquid and it turns it into something solid almost before your very own eyes. And then as it cools in the refrigerator, because it'll still need to cool for some time, it gives it a texture in which you can totally bite into. So it makes a heavier dessert, but an enormous amount of flavor. Another lighter way to go at this is, I mean, instead of using uh, the uh, cornstarch as I do, is to use gelatin. And what I can tell you with gelatin, I think it makes it too soft, but it makes almost much more of an ice cream-like consistency to it, the kind that you can spoon over. So if you decide to do gelatin instead of cornstarch, keep this in mind. Gelatin, you need about one teaspoon to each one full cup of liquid that you use in order to solidify. Now, watch what's happening. Don't look at me anymore. Look at this. It's nice and hot. At this point, we start adding our cornstarch, and as we add the cornstarch, we stir consistency. What we want to make sure is to create almost a well that absorbs all of the cornstarch and the violence involved into the rhythmic addition of what we're doing right now is basically allowing for the cornstarch to melt, go straight into the milk, and as it opens up, in its most basic way, it will thicken up the cream right in front of our very own eyes. We got the consistency that I want at this point. Now, let's pour this into my favorite container, this glass, a martini glass. I'm gonna put it right in here. We have placed our dessert in our favorite container, but before we can actually eat and enjoy it the way it's supposed to be, it has to cool and it has to thicken up. So I'm going to bring it to the refrigerator for a few hours. Once it cools off, the top part becomes like a little crust. You've seen this with just about every pudding that you make. Now, this is great because it will be able to absorb the layers of flavor that I want to add to it. Now, this is chocolate that I have grated as fine as possible. And what I like to do is to almost cover the complete top of it. The part that I love is because of the fact that it's hardened up, I have the ability with a spoon now to spread it. If this was soft, we could not be doing this. And I like to do a so that almost creates a crust of its own. Mind you, this is wonderful uh, semi-sweet chocolate that I grated ahead of time. And keep in mind, with every bite that you take of this, you're gonna be taking a bite of the pudding underneath and it will make the perfect combination. We also have some whipping cream that we whipped ahead of time. And I like to add it right in here, well, there you are. And then this is typical Sicilian, a maraschino cherry right on top to wish us well. And it's so cute, it's so fun. You can control the texture of the dessert and the sweetness by increasing the sugar and by also increasing the amount of cornstarch. On the other hand, if you like to have a looser, you diminish the amount of the cornstarch. Just because I give you the recipe doesn't mean that that recipe is the absolute only way in which something can be done. And like my father used to tell me, there is nothing in life that you cannot do. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is how you make the magic of Bianco Mangiare.
There are so many ancillary flavors that can be brought to the consistency of a vegetable. Something as simple as a potato, as far as I'm concerned, can be turned into something worthy of a king without using a single piece of meat. You should see what I can do with potato and broccoli. I make a soup, it's something else. But when nobody looks, I also add a little bit of bacon. Why? It tastes so good. <laughs> Vegetarian, me? If I can have a little bacon once in a while, it'll be okay. Hey, maybe I could do that. Maybe. No, meatballs. No, no, no. I cannot do without meatballs. No, no, no. That's it. We cannot do vegetarian. We cannot do vegetarian. Occasionally, I am caught by inspirations that even surprise me. I ask myself, how could such stunning intelligence come upon a man and a body like this? The answer never came to me, but once I realized that it must be the kind of food that I eat. Now, we have everything we want. Take a look at the consistency of the soup. Did you guys see this fly that came by me? No. Okay, then I'm happy. <laughs> Carissimi amici, dear friends, join me in my kitchen because today we're going to make pan-fried potatoes with sun-dried tomatoes and rosemary. So simple, so full of flavor. Pork chop with pizzaiola sauce, a sauce with a little taste of pizza to it, an old treat from my past, and pasta, agu e ogu, garlic and oil pasta. And today I'm going to share with you a story about the importance of Sundays in the Stellino family. Go for the recipes. Stay for the story. Sunday was always a very special day because for many families who did not have the ability to be in together because their mom or their dad had to work most of the day, Sunday was the one guaranteed day that after church everybody would get together and this fantastic family dinner would take place. And my mom always rose to the occasion. To be a child in my house was a treat. Walking into the house, smelling the aromas coming from the kitchen, the first thing that I would do, I was always curious, I would go in there and see what's in the pots and the pans what she was making. Pan-fried potatoes with sun-dried tomatoes and infused with garlic and rosemary. This is a side dish that tastes so good, it could be a meal to itself. Let me show you how to make it. The first thing that we've done, we have placed extra light olive oil. These potatoes that are squared out, I've also parboiled in the present shape for about five minutes. Then I drained them real well, and now we're gonna put them in here. Enough said, let's snap into action now. On your very first step, what you want to ensure is not to move the potatoes at all. Let them be as they are, inside the pan. Why? People ask me always, eh, it doesn't matter, it matters. This will ensure as if you are patient enough to let them for one and a half, two minutes to let them be on the same side, to start forming the first bit of browning, which is central to the success of this dish. What I have in my hand is rosemary. And there's a story that goes with this rosemary. My father uh, always loved to cook meats with rosemary, especially uh, roasted potatoes. And we used to go in the garden, we had a very small garden in those days, and there was a big pot that my father had planted with rosemary, he would cut the fresh rosemary. I don't know why it's so emotional to me, but adding the rosemary to these potatoes uh, is a very symbolic and important uh, moment for me. Now, why is it that I didn't cut the rosemary? Leaving them as the whole branch, you will sense the presence of the rosemary, but you will not see it. Now, let's turn it. And here I go with the first shuffle. Now, we're gonna do flavoring through a series of layers. What does it mean? First, we go with sea salt. And if it's from Sicily, it's even better. Together with the salt, the next best friend is the pepper. Why am I doing this? You see this technique? It looks good. It means nothing, but it looks great on TV. <laughs> I love to say that all the time. You know, you have to joke with yourself, otherwise if you don't have fun while you cook, what's the point? Yeah. 
these are whole pieces of garlic. I'm going to cook the potato over some more of a long period of time. And I want for them to cook with the potatoes at the same time. It's too bad that we do not have the ability to send out the aroma because one of the most astonishing things that does remind me of home is the smell. <laughs> I know, I know, I'm in my house already. What am I talking about? You, you have to see it from my point of view. Sunday, you go out with your friends, you talk to them. We go to church, we come back home, and here is my dad, you know. And my dad has uh, undone his tie, his collar is open, he's in the kitchen, he's cooking, you smell this aroma, he's telling stories, my mom is telling stories, my uncles are there, my cousins. And you say, what's it got to do with food? And you say, what's it got to do with potatoes? Why are potatoes so special? Let me tell you. You cook these potatoes right, not only they're special, but they put a smile on your face. They taste fantastic. It is at this point that there is another addition of flavor. What we have here is sun-dried tomatoes that we have kept fairly big, sun-dried tomatoes packed in olive oil. It's important that they're packed in olive oil. This dish will cook fairly quickly. I would say anywhere between uh, eight to 10 minutes, you should be able to have a complete dish in your hand. But this is only if you do parboil the potatoes. If you don't parboil the potatoes, you can still use it this way, but it will take you a few minutes longer. So always add an additional five minutes to that. Now, you don't need to do this, but I happen to have some fresh oregano, and I just cannot let it go, and oregano and rosemary go perfect together. I know, I'm super happy. The potatoes are ready. Let me show you to plate them. People say, how can you be so happy about just a plate of potatoes? And I tell them, to me, these are not potatoes. To me, these are special magic time machines all of them in the shape of potatoes. These potatoes take me to a place where life was beautiful, <laughs> where everything made sense. Where as a child, I always look up ahead and saw my parents, the food that they prepared, the smiles, the surround of the family. These are the things that you remember when life is tough. You do not realize this, but every time you cook something from your family, from your past in a certain way, you once again find yourself visiting those moments that left you behind. And in my case, they were beautiful moments. And this, this is how you make pan-fried potatoes infused with rosemary and sun-dried tomatoes. But those aromas stayed with me for all the years that I was in America when I felt this, this sense of loss of everything that I left behind. So to me, Sunday is a time when I reconnect with my Italian heritage braised meats, roasted potatoes, these long, laborious dishes that usually would not do every day just because they take too much time. But on Sunday, on Sunday, I love to make it. Sunday dinner with the Stellinos continues, and the next recipe I'm about to share with you is pork chop with pizzaiola sauce, a sauce with a little taste of pizza to it. Let me show you how to make it. Pork chop pizzaiola. Two things I'm gonna teach you today. How to make pizzaiola sauce and how to make the pork chop Palermo style. Let me show you what I mean. Here we have our pork chop, beautiful as you can see. But for us to cook it and do it right, we need to pound it. So several techniques available to us on how to do it. Let me show you the best part of it all. What I have in here is a basic plastic bag that has a slider onto it. Why do I place it in here? Why is this important? We want to pound this, but at the same time, we want to contain within this the way in which this will expand. One of the difficult things that people have using the pounder is that I'm unaware of how the meat expands. Watch this, look how simple it is. And every time you need to pound it in a different fashion, you do this. What is a technique here? What are we looking for? We want to pound and slide out. As you can see, this is already gotten thinner on this side. You want to do it evenly all the way across. 
And this is what people really need to understand. When it comes down to it, we are pounding for two reasons. We wanna make the meat itself thinner, so it's easier to cut into it, it's more tender. But at the same time, what we want to make sure is that we don't pound it so thin that we shred it apart. The technique with the plastic bag, as I'm showing you, prevents you from doing so. Very easy, you can do several of these at the time. Saves you an enormous amount of time. for us. Now we need to do the Palermo style. How do we do that? Let me move this back into the tray. Your hands are the most beautiful instruments that you could possibly imagine. So I like to place it on the breadcrumbs, but I like to do two things. First, I like to brush it with a little bit of olive oil. Extra virgin olive oil will do well. It's additional flavor in this case. And here we go with... This is not from Palermo. <laughs> this technique that I'm using right now, I learned it barbecuing here in the United States. It's a layering of several flavors. We have uh, onion powder, garlic powder, paprika. I put on this one a little bit of cayenne, salt, pepper, and brown sugar. Now, we'll go to the other side as well. Use your hands like this. Make sure that everything is covered all the way through. And you see from a small piece of meat how much bigger this piece already is. I think that one of the techniques was designed in the old days just to render this look of something big from something small. Now you can do this ahead of time, but don't let this one sit in the refrigerator. Once you put the breading, the pané, like we say a Palermo, the next thing that you want to do is to cook it. Let me show you how to do that. The one thing that you want to make sure is shake off some of the excess and then very attentively, when you put this baby in, we start at the bottom, we go all the way to the end and then you let go. You want to cook this for just a couple of minutes per side because this thing at this point, uh, we've taken it down from almost an inch of thickness to roughly about a quarter of an inch, maybe at most a half of an inch. What you will notice also is that as the pork chop is cooking, it's shrinking a little bit in size. Is that a problem? No. What's happening is basically trying to retain as much as possible of its own juices on the inside. As it does that, it's starting to provide a crust on the other side. Let's take a look and see how the crust is doing for us. This is exactly what we're looking for. And at this point, you want to continue the cooking until the other side looks exactly like this. One of the things that might be challenging for some of you is the bone. So what I want to show people is, when it gets to this point, the natural juices are trying to escape through the bone joint. So what I like to do is brown them like that. Look at this. So you just need a, a few minutes per side. When I do this for myself, I don't do any more than two, three minutes per side, depending on the thickness of it. So let's put this one aside now. now let me show you how to make the sauce. So in this particular case, we start the same way in which we started all our other recipe. Nice, thick garlic, add it to it. What this garlic will do for us, it will give us this wonderful rendition of joy. Garlic, joy, is it possible? Well, in my world, it is. Now, this is a little trick that I love. I started the oil in the pan, but the oil was cold. So I want to add the garlic uh, while the oil is cold. Why? Biggest mistake that people make. In every recipe that I've ever seen that they use the garlic wrong is to burn the garlic. You burn the garlic, it's over. So by doing it this way, you're able to maintain the temperature that you want to get to and the garlic cooking in a uniform way. Plus, you don't burn the garlic because you have the ability to control it. And right here is where we're at. This is the point where the garlic is doing its thing. We're gonna lower the heat a little bit down. And at this point, we add red pepper flakes. We have fresh oregano. And if you never tried fresh oregano before, you should. To the fresh oregano, we add some basil and some parsley. Why are we making this infusion? Why is that important? What's it doing for us? We've got to continue with some of the other flavoring. A little bit of salt to go at the bottom of it, and a little bit of pepper. 
But the most surprising thing is about to come now. Now, this is not a Sicilian thing. This is something that I've been experimenting with a great deal and my belief in the yin and yang of things. A little bit of brown sugar. And when I say a little bit, I'm talking a pinch. If you really want to go into measure, you don't want to do any more than an eighth of a spoon. The garlic is perfectly browning for us the way that we want it. And here we go now with the other ingredient. This you're going to love. This is peeled tomatoes, which we strain and chop. This is uh, every Sunday at home, you know, to hear uh, my mom and my dad talking about what they're making, to hear the words, uh, uh, let's make uh, some pizzaiola, immediately we'd be super happy. At this point, we're adding some of the reserved juice from the peeled tomatoes. Make sure that you do reserve them because they're very important for us in making the sauce. And it's at this point that we lower the heat down to medium-low and we let this sauce come together on its own. My memories. You know, as you become an adult, I think that your memories become even better what truly did happen. But this, this was for me something that defined the moment of Sunday at the house, the pasta, the pizzaiola, the potatoes would come out, and mom and dad telling their stories, and me being a child looking forward to every Sunday at home knowing that something special would take place. At this point, I like to taste. Now, I use this technique because my finger is much stronger than my lips. It allows me to control the drip of the sauce from the back of the spoon, and the flavor is so good, I'm hardly able to talk. But the sauce is ready. Now, the last thing that we need to do in this hit is to let the pork chop basically braise into the sauce. We're gonna have it on a medium-low heat, and we're gonna let this cook into the sauce until it cooks all the way through. All right, let's be clear about something. How long does it take? Because don't you hate it when people tell you, hey, you cook it uh, until it's ready. When is it ready? So usually for something of this uh, size, this was about a three quarter inch uh, uh, pork chop that I got, we pounded it down to a quarter inch. Uh, I cooked it about two and a half minutes on each side, uh, frying it. And here in the sauce, I like to keep it into the sauce for another four to five minutes. And that should take care of completely cooking it through. Remember, the thing that's most important, you do not want to use high heat. This is a soft braising process that gives you the yield that you're looking for. We let this baby go for a few minutes. I can feel from the touch that she's ready to go, so let me show you how to plate it. It's gonna be fantastic. There are many dishes that define who we are in life, that define us for the past that we come from. I think that we feel the past first and foremost with our mind and with our memories and with our taste. The Sporcho Pizzaiola reminds me of a table full of family, my mom, my dad, even though they're on the other side, and I'm sure they're cooking for just about every angel in the sky. This, to me, is one of those dishes that defines my growth, from a young boy to a young man, and from a young man to a mature one that really knows how to cook. And this, well, this is how you make Porcho Pizzaiola. Pasta on Sunday is a must. Even if it's just my wife and I, even if we don't have people come into the house, it doesn't matter. It feels right that Sunday exists. Sunday is a very special day for me because uh, it reminds me of this unified family day that stays with you, even when you become an adult. <laughs> don't know what part of the world you're in, but if you're Italian, come Sunday, that is a pasta day. Uh, I cannot recall a dinner at my house on Sunday where pasta wasn't part of uh, the menu. This particular pasta is called agu e ogu, two Sicilian words. Agu, which means uh, garlic, ogu, which means uh, olive oil. By the way, if it's a Sicilian saying ogio, you know it's gonna be extra virgin olive oil. So this is the kind of recipe for which you want to use your best quality of extra virgin olive oil because the olive oil truly becomes the sauce. But I think I'm talking too much. Let me show you how to make it. Dealing with garlic, let me say something. Burnt garlic is not fun. <laughs> 
no matter how much you love garlic. So what we're trying to do in this particular recipe is to make sure that the garlic and the oil become one. Why did I cut the garlic so thick? What is the point? Most people like to cut it very, very thin. I like for the garlic to brown on the outside, and given the fact that we're going to cook this on medium, medium, low heat, we want for the garlic to cook all the way through. But at the same time, the garlic is going to infuse the oil with its own flavor, but it's not going to be alone. The next thing that we're going to do is that red pepper flakes. This is good enough just to give a hint of spice. Now, what you can see is that the garlic is starting to really pop in here, but it's not cooked all the way yet. We're gonna need several minutes to do that. And even though I'm cooking a medium low, the amount of heat being uh, reserved in the pan from the, the fact that I heated up this pan on high heat is still present. But what we're trying to do right now for the garlic in a certain way is to fry it and braise it at the same time. Why braising it? In this particular case, the garlic is as important as a piece of meat. As a matter of fact, in this particular case, the garlic substitutes the protein. If you look at the historical content of this particular dish, it's a dish that was prevalent, famous amongst the farmers. It's a dish uniquely made by poor people that cannot afford expensive ingredients, and yet, as all the dishes which are part of what we call the cucina povera, cucina povera means poor man cooking, are by far, in my opinion, the most relevant dishes in the Italian cuisine. One of the things that you're noticing is how the color is changing slowly. And the reason why it's changing slowly is because I keep turning it around, making sure that the garlic doesn't stand still in the same spot. What you want to have when this is done is almost like little candies. You bite into it, there will be the crust of the garlic on the outside. They will be somewhat resilient. But as you push with your molar all the way through, a cream like will splash all around your tongue, giving you this wonderful sensation of joy. Yeah, to me, garlic is joy. But the fact that this garlic will accompany my favorite pasta, it's even better. You can see that now most of the pieces of garlic are picking up the browning that we want to. It is at this point that I don't mind glazing it with additional flavors. Sea salt, first and foremost. And a little bit of pepper. Shake it so that it goes all over the pan. You also have to realize that right now, in spite of the fact that you're not seeing this, there is an enormous amount of flavor that's taking place here inside the oil. The oil right now is the sauce. This oil will basically shape the way in which the pasta will taste. So the salt and the pepper are the two basic things that we want to have in there, but the juices that have leaked out of the garlic are now present. We now have the perfect color. Watch what we're doing next. We're going to add chopped parsley. The parsley will fry in it. By the way, to make this even more interesting when you do this at home, you can do a parsley, you can do a mixture of parsley and mint, mint is fabulous, also use basil. At this point is your fantasy. What you choose to do, it's the way to do it. The garlic is perfectly cooked. It's picked up a gorgeous browning. And remember, brown is good, black is not. I love the color black. You can see it from my shirt as well, but does not do well with garlic. Now, we're gonna go with our pasta. Pasta is cooked al dente. What does it mean? The pasta is slightly undercooked. Why? I want two things. I want for all the flavors to penetrate the pasta completely. And the oil right now is toasting the pasta. At this point, I lowered it down to low. I'm gonna crank it back up to medium high. And I want to see a little bit of toasting taking place with this pasta. This is the element that a lot of people miss. They simply put it into the oil. They give it a couple of uh, flips. I mean, you don't need to do what I'm about to do. But there's the difference between good and great. Let me show you to make it great. This dish, as I mentioned before, is a dish that's mostly done by people who have no means, or very little means. So every element that comes into is imbued with enormous flavor. The enormous flavor already put in by the garlic is evident, but what you don't know yet is that what we're going to add now is Italian-style breadcrumbs, which I had previously toasted. Why are we doing this? What's the importance? What's the difference? Watch the pan and look what happens. Now, 
These breadcrumbs are doing two things. They're absorbing the additional oil that's left in the pan, which is the sauce, and they're sticking themselves as a secondary coating to the pasta. Why is this important? You don't just have pasta at this point. You have several coatings, meaning that every bite that you take in, there will be the garlic, there will be the parsley, there will be the pasta. And then there's one more ingredient that I'm gonna add in just a moment. The pasta's gotten us exactly where we want to go. Turn off the heat completely at this point. It is at this point that we go with cheese. Now, traditional cheese is pecorino, which uh, in the United States, very similar cheese you find, pecorino romano, but I believe that the Sicilian pecorino is even better. Ladies and gentlemen, the pasta's gotten exactly the look that I wanted to give it to it, and now we're ready to plate it. Let me show you. This pasta is more than a plate of pasta to me. This pasta is a very vivid memory of my youth. Uh, this pasta made me. Uh, I fell in love with pasta, I think, the first time that I had agio ogio. I can recall it, how my father used to make, how my mom used to make it, and the way in which I evolved my own style in making it. I think that this is a recipe that tells a family story, the story of my family. So, next Sunday, when you're wondering what to do, keep this in mind. How about making some pasta agio ogio? And this is how you make Pasta, agio, e ogio. But what I remember is walking in from church, opening the door, walking into the house, and just smelled that aroma. And I knew that paradise was waiting for me. Sunday, Sunday's paradise. Il mangiare della domenica è perfetto, which translated in English means whatever you eat on Sunday is perfect. Well, especially if you're at my house. What a wonderful day. Follow me into my kitchen. Today, we're going to make swordfish agrodolce, sweet and sour. For all of you out there who are married, I will show you a way to get out of the doghouse. Scallops with red peppers and zucchini sauce. And we end with, this is your lucky day. I'm going to show you how to make saute calamari with garbanzo beans. And I will share a story about me, Sicily, and the sea. Come for the recipes. Stay for the story. There's a connection between the ocean and us Sicilians. Uh, Sicily was always a, a very active port. And one of the most interesting things about Sicily is in the fact, of the fact that we are so proud to be so unique and so Sicilian. We are a mix of just about everything. French, Spanish, Arabs. Uh, all the invasions that came through uh, not only brought a change in our political system, but even more importantly, they brought a change in the way we eat. Today I want to share with you one of my favorite recipes from my youth, swordfish agrodolce, sweet and sour. Let me show you. Pesce spada in agrodolce. It's a mouthful, isn't it? Hey, this is swordfish, sweet and sour, Sicilian style, specifically from the town of Palermo. They make a version in the town of Messina, but they're not this good. What can you do? They're not from Palermo. Let me show you how to make it. It starts with a very easy, simple sauce. We have some olive oil in here getting nice and hot. To this, we're going to add the most important addition, which is a little bit of red pepper flakes, because if you're from Palermo, you do like your food spicy. And then garlic. The garlic, as you can see, is cut thick. Why? This is going to be a sauce that will cook for a certain period of time. When the garlic is nice and thick like this, in spite of the fact that it will brown on the outside, it still stays somewhat raw on the inside. What I want to do is like braise the sauce for a while is for this garlic to completely almost melt inside. 
not inside the sauce, but melts into your mouth. As the garlic is starting to jump, we're gonna add the other ingredients. Onions, you can use white onions if you want. I like red onions uh, just because uh, they remind me of Sicily. Uh, the flavor is slightly more piquant, if I can use a French word, in spite of the fact that we're talking about a Sicilian recipe. We're cooking this on medium heat, and the medium heat part is very important. You do not want to burn this dish. A lot of people, one of the mistakes that they make is they cook with a heat that's too high. When the heat is too high, you turn your food into burnt charcoal briquettes. Don't want to do this when you're dealing with onions. So in this particular case, we just want it to soften up. They're getting right to the point that we want. This is fresh fennel. What I like about the fennel is the freshness that it brings into the sauce. Uh, it stays crisp, it's full of water. So as you bite into it, there is this wonderful uh, difference between the softness of the sauce and the crispiness that it has. And it's also very fresh, refreshing. It has this wonderful licorice-like essence. Uh, the flavoring of this is unique, but wait a minute, it's not over. The next thing we're going to do is we're gonna add some beautiful uh, salt and raisins, yellow in color. What we had done with those uh, raisins before using for the cooking, and this is very important, you wanna put this dry raisins into a bowl of hot water. And let it sit there for about 20 minutes. It will revive the raisins. If you put them straight out of the box in here, the raisins will still taste good, but it will be very dry and it will be very chewy. Uh, now we go with the other mysterious ingredient, which is the pine nuts that makes it so Palermo style. And together with the pine nuts, we go with two herbs. Basil, which you know is something that Sicilians do love. But even more interesting, even more interesting is mint. And this mint is a combination that together with the fresh fennel uh, really takes it to the next level. But there is a secret now. This is the latest discovery, an addition that I refer to as the yin and yang. In the old days, it used to be done with plain sugar, uh, white sugar. On the other hand, lately I've discovered the joy of brown sugar, and I love the fact that brown sugar has also molasses attached to it. So we're putting a little bit of brown sugar into the mix, and together with the brown sugar, and this is extremely important, white vinegar. This is the most important part of the recipe because as the sugar melts and it starts to coat all the ingredients in the pan, it reacts with the vinegar. As it reacts with the vinegar, it creates already a base for the sweet and sour. Now, we're just about where we want to be. It is at this point that we want to deglaze the ingredients in the pan with a little bit of white wine. You can use any wine that you like. Chardonnay will be wonderful. Uh, this is the kind of sauce that can take the wonderful body. Now, what I'm doing, I'm reducing the wine, and as I'm reducing the wine, I'm reintroducing into 